no no big pop i'll sing it this time so they can't copyright it i love it when you call me big pop bus here we are bono stuff uh this is repeat guest evangelos papas joining us from down on in australia how the weather down there in australia today uh it's getting colder so we're at the beginning of our winter here uh but yeah it's still sunny and pleasant you know when i say it gets colder that's that's like spring in new york basically <laughs> Yeah, where we originally met, for anyone not familiar. And uh, again, just to recoup, he was, this man was one of my professors at Long Island University, Brooklyn, where I got my doctorate in physical therapy, graduated 2008. Um, he has gone on to do some awesome things. We had a episode a few episodes ago. Uh, I don't remember the numbers, uh, but it was a very good chat. We went down some different paths. And today we wanted to focus on ACLs, and he has a little bit of a time crunch. So, I want to jump right into it. We have about 30 minutes, it looks like. So ACLs, tell me all about it. Uh, like, uh, I guess I guess I'll guess i tee it up to say, uh, I actually, and, and I think we touched on it last time, I tore my ACL uh, playing pickup football uh, shortly after graduating. So as soon as he left my life, um, <laughs> my ACL was no longer protected. That's what protected. happens to people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got to stick around, uh, Evangelo. So... Um, I tore my ACL. I went through that process. One question I want to jump right into and start out with is, uh, for anyone who's torn their ACL back then, the research I did showed that you have an 80% chance to develop arthritis if mm -hmm. you have an ACL reconstruction. So that's applicable. That was around 2008 data. Has there been anything new? I'd love to get the, the research updates from you as much as possible. Sure. Um, yeah, well, Boyd, it's great to be back. And thanks again for the invitation. Uh, if we do a part three, then I will require that you change the title to Boy and Evangelist, no stuff or something like that. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just, just, I'll just clarify that Bono stuff is, is the joke off of Bo Jackson. And the idea is I want my guests to teach me as much stuff as possible. So, of course, you know stuff. You're here to teach me oh. the things. Well, I, uh, okay, well, uh, I, I, more I, things. I, I'm no longer paying tuition. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, just a quick recap. Uh, uh, I, my, I'm a physiotherapist and I was your, your teacher back in the day in New York, uh, in my main area of, and I have a PhD in orthopedic biomechanics, my dissertation and open and the majority of my research after that is on ACL injuries, anything from the etiology of these injuries, epidemiology, all the way to the treatment. Um, so one thing that has not changed very much uh, since you and I to our ACL, uh, you know, a long time ago is that, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, 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 predisposition to developing knee osteoarthritis. So, so for those who don't know, maybe take it a step back. So, the ACL or anterior cruciate ligament is the size of the little finger, and it's right a ligament right in the center of the knee, and it can tear somewhat unpredictably when people play sports. Um, so, very frequently they are they they, they are non-contact injuries. So, it's a basketball player coming down from a layup, or a soccer player, you know, after a specific soccer maneuver. Um, and and it's the same thing they've done thousands of times and then this one time they hear a pop the acl is gone the knee becomes unstable uh, swelling immediate swelling and, and disability um uh and then frequently they they have surgery or actually maybe we can get into it later that there is some research around more conservative management of the acl so, and and obviously the main issue is that these are young athletes, frequently in their teens or early twenties, and they do develop uh, osteoarthritis um, relatively quickly, meaning like within ten or fifteen years, which again sounds like a long time. But if you are sixteen year old, then you know you develop osteoarthritis in your early thirties during some of your productive years. So this is what we refer to clinically as the young patient with the old knee. It's actually quite tragic because we don't have great treatments for them. You know, how do you treat uh, a severely neosteoarthritic knee in a, somebody who's in their early 30s? Uh, they're too young for knee replacement, and frequently knee replacement is not congruent with their expectations around physical activity. Um, and of course, you know, uh, they, even though they do last a long time nowadays, having a knee replacement at this age is, is, is uh, undesirable. Um, so, 
Uh, yes, sadly, there is this uh, rather significant increase uh, in the odd of developing new osteoarthritis after any serious joint injury, but particularly after ACL injury. Um, so the 80% sounds, you know, about right, but it also depends on the definition of osteoarthritis, whether it's radiographic or symptomatic or a combination of both. Um, because, you know, again, very frequently we have this uh, athlete, you know, somebody who had an ACL injury, you look at the X-ray film, it looks pretty bad, but, uh, but they're quite active and asymptomatic. So the correlation between what we see on X-ray films and uh, the uh, impact that it has on people's life is, is not great. Um, and of course, on the other hand, you have this uh, uh, person who tore their ACL 10 years ago, the, 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 the X-ray looks pretty good, but they do have a lot of pain, swelling, and so on and so forth. So it has affected the life. Um, so yeah, that is the, the big problem. It hasn't changed, but uh, just like everything uh, with these complex injuries, there are a lot of caveats, right? Um, so a pure ACL injury uh, that, uh, especially if, uh, if they may regain stability in some way, shape or form after that, um, the, the odds of developing osteoarthritis are lower, compared to a more grossly unstable knee that also has concomitant injuries such as meniscal tears, cartilage injuries that are pretty much like you know, the fast track uh, to knee osteoarthritis. Um, so not all ACL injuries are the same. Um, frequently there is another injury around the knee uh, and if it's the menisci, uh, then particularly the medial meniscus, then that may uh, accelerate the path towards uh, knee osteoarthritis. Uh, now, with all that said, that's not, not all doom and gloom, you know, because sure. people like you who tore their, their ACL a long time ago, frequently they are, you know, like you, you know, you're, you, they, they remain very active uh, for a long time after that. And anecdotally, I have met people who tore their ACL, you know, 30 or even 40 years ago, and they have lived a very active lifestyle, skiing down the slopes, dancing, you know, playing sports, and it hasn't bothered them. So that is uh, uh, why this area of research is fascinating. So, you know, um, I guess in some ways you're going back to saying when I was teaching you at LIU, you give away my age. Um, and I forgive you, I forgive you, you about that. You could have been a 21-year-old phenom professor there. That's right, or a 10-year-old. Yeah, I was teaching. Do Doogie Howser. Uh, that's right. Uh, but, but I think it's, uh, uh, now that I'm, I'm a bit more senior in academia, uh, certainly one of my big passions is to inspire uh, young people like you and even younger to get into research and discover more things about ACLs because it is really complex and it's a very important public health problem in many ways uh, so we should uh, learn as much as we can about uh, what causes these injuries how do we prevent them who needs what treatment and how do we match them so it is a, a very very fascinatingly complex problem I would say um, but yeah, to go back to answer your question, uh, one of the reasons that it is important is because the, the uh, ACL injury very frequently leads to uh, neosteoarthritis in young people. Perfect. And then two, two things off of that. One, so again, I, I, you, you did a great job better than me as the host here of, of explaining actually what we're talking about, anterior cruciate ligament, very important ligament in the knee. Uh, again, we both tore ours <laughs> and um, to, I guess I'll let you kind of tell, uh, decide which path we choose here of one super interesting area for me is the preventative model, mm -hmm. right? right. And, and so there's a lot of interesting research here. A friend of mine who uh, is a physical therapist for the Sacramento Kings, mm -hmm. she actually wrote a chapter in a book on ACL injury prevention. It's something I came close to, to diving into. Uh, if it's not too broad of a, of a, of a, of a path. And again, if we do a part three, we can certainly go down some other paths, but yeah, what, what is the effectiveness of these ACL injury prevention programs? Are there mm -hmm. ones that stand out to you as uh, more efficient or effective than, than others? Yeah, we have done lots of research on that. And here, and here's the thing that is really promising. You know, um, I, I mentioned earlier that the majority of these injuries are non-contact. Um, and that means that they are potentially preventable. So a lot of very, you know, a, a variety of different uh, sports injury prevention programs have been developed 
Uh, one of the more popular is the FIFA 11 Plus for soccer. Um, but some other sports metrics, you know, I have a variety, many different ones, some that are sports specific. So here in Australia, we have a sport called netball, which is not uh, uh, very popular uh, in, in other parts of the world, but the closest sport to that would be basketball, but it is actually a little bit different. Um, so there are some netball specific uh, uh, injury prevention programs that we have done some research with. Um, and, and, and here's the fascinating thing, they work. They work very well. So just to take it a step back, you know, when I was uh, young and, and, and playing more sports, the way we would warm up is with these static stretches, these prolonged static stretches. Um, and, and our coaches would tell us back then, that's how you warm up to prevent injuries. There is very limited research to demonstrate this. So we actually know that this passive stretching before you exercise, uh, is not very effective in preventing injury. So the whole idea is what can we do to warm up that not only you know uh, has the effect of warming up, but, but at the same time can be effective for injuries. So some of the more successful programs, so there are some that are actually a bit longer and, uh, and, and, and a bit more cumbersome, but some of the more successful ones are those that replace this traditional warm-up program uh, that they take you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then uh, and they incorporate exercises that teach good biomechanical technique, you know, some strengthening, some sport specific agility drills and uh, activities like that. Um, and, and, and the majority of the research has shown that these programs are, are very successful in decreasing. They cannot eliminate, but they can certainly substantially decrease the number of injuries um, we have done meta-analysis uh, that demonstrate this very clearly. Um, and meta-analysis are these type of studies where you pull data from all the studies on a specific topic that were published, and then you reanalyze them to uh, provide stronger conclusions. Um, and again, you know, we have demonstrated that we can cut these uh, 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 injuries on the lower extremity almost by half. Um, so then the question is, does that mean that as these programs are becoming more popular, we're having fewer ACL injuries. And here is the paradox. So even though these programs are becoming, you know, uh, there is more research to demonstrate their effectiveness, they're being uh, further developed and so on and so forth. On the other hand, we don't see ACL injuries becoming less frequent on, and we may even see a little bit of an uptick uh, of uh, uh, ACL injuries. So then there is a few reasons for that. Hopefully more people are engaging into sports. Last year is probably a, an exception. Um, but uh, at the same time, these programs don't have a great uptake. So even though they're effective, they work, mm -hmm. they, have, they require minimal resources very frequently, um, we don't see, especially in community sports, um, implemented quite widely. So that's an area, another area of research that uh, it's really interesting. How do we get uh, these programs out in the co in community sports more, more uh, and, and implemented more widely? So that's a very long answer. Right? You know, I could have just said <laughs> yes, yes, they work. Uh, and uh, yeah, for those uh, uh, listeners who have spaced out, that's the message. They work. They're very effective when utilized. But at, to your point, I'll, I, I will say, yeah, they probably don't get utilized as often as they should. And hence, we do see the grand statistics going up unfortunately uh that i've definitely noticed that trend as well and similar to we have all these great resources around more more people going to gyms and again covid withstanding uh but still chronic disease has been going up uh you know year by year this is the first generation uh, i don't know if you heard this statistic the first generation that is uh the life expectancy is shorter mm -hmm. than the previous generation very scary statistics so yeah despite all all of our knowledge and having things that work, it's the implementation. And, and again, some people, I guess, look at it and might say, we, we, even if they're you know, confident that it's a 50% reduction in injury risks, is, is it worth it to do it that way? Or, you know, so, so it's an interesting thing for sure. So um, I wanna jump over to another question we got from a listener here um, about the types of grafts. So if you do tear mm -hmm. your ACL, the, and, and uh, you had the uh, patella tendon, I, Yes, so I, I did as well. Uh, so the, the main options are if you tear your ACL and you want it reconstructed, right? Uh, there's different factors you speak with your surgeon about. 
Um, and so I'm curious at this point, if, if anything, out of the research, any one of these is more uh, yep. favorable than the other. There's obviously mm -hmm. different implications, different surgeons will have different preferences. That's something else I'd love to touch on. Um, but as far as the options, I'll let you kind of run with the, the top options. Yeah, okay, so again, just a step back. So what happens if somebody tears their ACL? Um, there is some developing research in this area, but it does not heal back, it does not grow back, uh, unlike other ligaments. So, so I shouldn't say it does not, it rarely does. Um, but there, you know, our, our understanding in this area is, uh, is also developing because there are examples of, of ACL that are torn and then they reattach and they regrow. Uh, but in general, that doesn't happen. Um, so the options are you stay ACL deficient, meaning that you have a knee that is functioning without an ACL uh, uh, anterior cruciate ligament, uh, or you have it surgically reconstructed which requires taking a graft, either an allograft from a cadaver, from a dead person, or an autograft from that same patient uh, from somewhere else in their body, um, and, and uh, drilling tunnels within the uh, knee, the tibia and the femur, and trying to replicate the anatomy of the original ACL. Um, so the question is, you know, what type of graft uh, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the different type of graphs. Um, and, and it is fascinating how much geographical variability there is there. Mm. So again, you know, having uh, uh, worked in physiotherapy and worked with orthopedic surgeons in Europe, in the United States and in Australia, there is wide variability, even within the United States, you know, it really depends on where, where you are. So, so I guess if we're going to summarize the advantages is that the autographs are stronger, they don't fail as frequently, uh, but at the same time, there is more pain and more disability, not only as the result of the surgery to, to reconstruct the ACL, but also from uh, uh, harvesting the graft. Um, and the autographs there sometimes are at the front of the knee, the part of the patella tendon, sometimes it's part of the hamstrings. Um, so these are the two most popular autographs, while the allographs, again, they can come from different parts of the cadaver. Um, so, so if we're going to summarize the advantages and disadvantages is that the, the patella tendon, it, it hurts more, uh, it leads more frequently to pain at the knee, uh, even after the end of rehabilitation. So patellofemoral pain, clicking around the knee. There is a little bit of evidence that they may be more associated with, with increased patellofemoral osteoarthritis. Um, on the other hand, ha ha but it is a very strong graft, okay? So the patella tendon graft is something that you don't want it in the hands of an inexperienced surgeon. Right, because if it is placed wrong, uh, in, in, in wrongly and with wrong tension and, and in the wrong location, then it can lead to severe motion restriction within the knee. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's probably true for everything, um, uh, but, but particularly for patella tendon. The hamstring graft has become much more popular uh, because it is a bit um, more of a forgiving graft, but at the same time, the, there is less pain and less disability associated with harvesting the hamstring graft. Uh, here in Australia, the vast majority of primary ACL reconstructions are with hamstring grafts. Hmm. The same in, in Greece, where you know I was practicing right after finishing physical therapy school there. Uh, now it has become the most popular choice. Um, and then the allografts, as we said, just because they tend to fail a bit more frequently, uh, they, they, they are reserved more for the less active older patients. Mm -hmm. um, but between the hamstring and the, and the patella tendon, you know, there, there are advantages and disadvantages of each one of them. Um, there is a little bit of evidence showing that the hamstring graft fails a little bit more, uh, mm. just a little bit higher rate. And the patella tendon, again, there is disagreement there, but I think most of the well-designed meta-analysis have demonstrated a small effect there. Um, well, uh, at the uh, other, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, uh, when they did a survey asking, even though the hamstring graft is the most popular graft, when they did the survey asking uh, surgeons, what would you use for professional athletes, then the patella tendon graft was mm. more popular. Yeah. Um, 
So again, you know, advantages and disadvantages, maybe, maybe the key message here is go with the graph that the surgeon is more comfortable with mm -hmm. uh, and go with the surgeon who does lots of them. So again, yeah. the good thing about you and me being in New York, you know, a few uh, big, uh, very, uh, 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 very experienced teams of orthopedic surgeons mm -hmm. there they, they, that they have experience with a lot of graphs. Um, one fascinating research study showed that the majority of ACL reconstructions are performed by surgeons who do fewer than 10 per year. Right. And that, that is the challenge. And that's, that's so, if, and if you're in that situation, you're listening to this and you know, somebody who's about to have the surgery, that's its own separate uh, podcast video resource of how do we make that decision? And I think it's fair, you know, I think there's some intimidation in that situation of this is the doctor, I trust the doctor. However, it, I think it's a fair question to say, how many of these do you do per year? And if it's under oh, 10, I, I don't know if you have a specific number that other than what the research, you know, if, if it can tell us if it's under, you know, it, somebody who does under 10 doesn't mean that they're not a very good surgeon, but. No, uh, that's it, right. But, you know, it may be that they're <laughs> early in their career or they may right. just live in an area where uh, they, they, you know, they have to do a variety of different, but, but, but again, you know, uh, there is strong research in orthopedic surgery which makes a lot of sense that the surgeon, the centers that do more of certain procedures, they have better outcomes, key replacements, knee replacements, yeah. ACL reconstructions. So it may be one of these uh, uh, examples because it is actually a quite complicated surgery. Yeah. Uh, so it may be one of these examples where people need to travel to uh, a center where they, they're the surgeons, uh, you know, do three per week or five yeah. per week, you know, yeah. and there are centers like that. So I, I want to jump. I, don't, I think you can see the question also on the I screen can. here. Uh, I'll read it for the audio only folks um, from my friend Richard in Brooklyn. Uh, and he was actually pretty much across the street from LIU. I don't know oh. if you ever got to meet him. But uh, regarding replication, what is his feeling on the double bundle technique? So a little more advanced question for, for some oh. clinicians. Um, just any, any, any parts of the research that you want to touch on with the double bundle? Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so again, you know, they looking at the anatomy of the ACL, there are two bundles, the posterior medial and the anterior lateral, that they do have distinctly different function uh, in terms of uh, preventing anterior translation and rotation. So again, you know, orthopedic surgeons had the very logical idea, and that I originally I think it was developed in Japan, um, why instead of using a single graft, just one string of tissue, why don't we use two graphs to replicate both of these bundles? Again, theoretically, a great idea. It became much more popular for Freddie Fu, uh, who is at the University of Pittsburgh. And again, that's a excellent, you know, the, talking about uh, large centers that do lots of these surgeries. Um, Ibrahimovic, the soccer player, went there to have his ACL reconstruction a few years ago. Um, when you know he he uh, was trained in this technique, he did lots of research and made it much more popular. So, disappointingly, I would say the research studies that have come out of that show no effect, uh, no no mm. no greater effect, no better outcomes with doing gotcha. double bundle reconstruction. Um, again, it may have a place, particularly around those who have more rotational instability, because it does uh, tend to biomechanically restrict this a little bit more. Uh, but in general, for the average patient who tore their ACL, it seems that the cost benefit analysis does not justify a double bundle reconstruction because there are risks. You know, there is two mm -hmm, tunnels mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the femur. It's a more complicated surgery. Uh, revision of the surgery is it's much more uh, complex. Um, and it does look that this topic is, is quite uh, extensive, so we may need a part three at some point. <laughs> There's definitely the so many, point. and I, I have like seven or eight other things yeah. I just, I'd love to, to jump into. So maybe we can move on from the double bundle uh, part. Again, I, I, it looks like you have seven more minutes about for, for me about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, I think I'm about <laughs> seven or-, or So uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm I'm gonna steal- 10, 15 here. I'm, um, I'm gonna- or, Mm -hmm. I'm going to steal but, from, but, I'm going to steal yeah. from uh, a, 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 some other podcast I've listened to, and we're going to put a little clock and give you two minute time limit to answer each question. If that, if that's all <laughs> well, right, that's going to be challenging. But <laughs> I can, if I can finish answering this question, you know, maybe, you know, expand to surgeries in general, 
the other exciting topic is the ALL, the anterolateral ligament, uh, which uh, um, is, is another ligament that also restricts rotation around the knee. So there is good research uh, on this topic uh, that is rapidly expanding. So surgeons now in combination frequently with the ACL, they can perform an ALL reconstruction. But again, uh, the idea there is that it restricts uh, further rotation. So in addition to the double bundle, there are a variety of different techniques that can help the patient who has gross rotational instability. Gotcha. One other one thing that uh, you seem to be very popular, I don't know, uh, real quick, again, I know this can open a can of worms, but the posterior lateral corner uh, mm -hmm. Is that something, I, it seemed to be very like, we think there's some significant thing going on here. Uh, I don't know if the research has faded. Again, I've kind of uh, stopped like diving into every research study like I used to do. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, th this is where I can turn to folks like you who- <laughs> That's <laughs> right, yeah. Good. Good. And, and, and then I just read uh, what smarter people uh, publish on these topics. So <laughs> for the poster ladder corner, you know, is the back and outside part of the knee that includes the lateral collateral ligament um, so rarely thankfully the this corner and the lcl is injured in addition to the acl so it is very it's rare but it's extremely important because if these injuries are left unrecognized they can lead to failure of an acl reconstruction uh, so one reason that it has become more popular in you know uh, since, since we've been following this literature is that we have better recognition of these injuries um, mm -hmm. so thankfully now you know uh, the physiotherapy the physical therapists and the um, athletic trainers and the orthopedic surgeons are much more aware that this mm -hmm. is a, a very important uh, uh, additional injury and if it's recognized it needs to be addressed i feel like around the time i was graduating 2008 was when they only developed uh, the, the like almost athletic training special test to even look at and add the poster lateral corner as as an area to even assess um so so yeah i'm guessing exactly. it just became we're teaching you cutting edge uh <laughs> yeah. examination at long island university back then bro speak that's a great segue well, my, my next topic i really wanted to touch on is post-op ice how do you feel about icing there's been a few of these fun controversies around it not sure if you've seen it followed it but uh i you know traditional rice rest ice compression elevation for anything that's swollen in your body how do you feel about it uh what, what what's what's the research say in the context of ACL reconstruction. Uh, let's go with eight. Let's do, let's stick with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, again, it's one of those things that uh, uh, it can decrease the swelling. So it's something mm -hmm. that traditionally in physical therapy we've been using and we'll be taking it as fact that, uh, okay, you have an acute injury or acutely, uh, you're actively post-surgical and you need to ice and, and everybody was doing it basically mm -hmm. um more elaborate techniques uh, some of the compressions with eyes you know have been developed that you can wrap around your knee and they use either mechanical or gravity mm -hmm. uh, to circulate uh you know cold water into a bladder that goes around the knee um patients feel better with this uh right. again it may have some short-term effects in terms of decreasing swelling allowing you a little bit earlier mobilization long term it probably makes very little difference mm -hmm. I, I guess the theory that i'm going off of and i've the, the debate i've seen is by icing you are removing the natural the, the, the natural healing of the body basically and so similar to i guess a little bit of a jump but if uh, for for those not listening prp platelet rich plasma allows the it's its own body's healing process so by icing you're removing the natural healing so the yeah argument is instead of icing it's motion compression and elevation um so mm -hmm. to control the swelling you can uh, you know i when i uh, had my bed up against a wall and i would live with my leg 90 degrees so that <laughs> gravity was doing its job i did have a game yeah. ready as well uh right. for maximum control which is that exactly what you're talking about it would have the pneumatic uh compression and be pumping cold water in there so uh yeah i mean i, I don't think there anyone's gonna have a perfect answer for that one um, but yeah, it's, it's an, it's a fun little debate that I think has been going on and, and, uh, 
you know, which I, is good I think to see, yeah, because mm -hmm. you see, uh, they, going a bit more broadly, there's all these things that we've been taking as as uh, truth in mm -hmm. medicine and physical therapy, um, and it's good to see that this is questioned, uh, including eyes. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's exactly what you said. You know that it's the natural response of the body, so we right. can control it. But right. you know, it's there for a purpose. I guess the other analogy here there is fever. Uh, mm. So is uh, fever is a natural response that can help with destroy bacteria, I guess. And then I'm going way mm -hmm. outside my knowledge uh, depth <laughs> here. Um, but uh, it, it, should it always be managed and decreased, or or actually right. by doing that, uh, of course, you know, if it becomes too, too dangerous, it has to be managed because it can mm -hmm. be life threatening. But uh, yeah, it, does it have a, 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 a does it provide a benefit in the uh, response of the body that uh, is beneficial and by uh, taking antipyretics do we take remove that similar food eyes yeah right uh, yeah I mean what I've uh, I, sp I spoke with a few folk who are very anti ice and they point mm -hmm. to the fact that uh, I guess they infiltrated the uh, major league baseball and you used to see pitchers with big things of ice sitting on the bench at any time they'd finish the game and now I guess they, they don't do that you just don't see it anymore for for at least the last decade or so. Um, so it seems to be something there. Again, mm -hmm. doesn't mean any and again correlative and all that stuff. The last one I'll, I'll throw out at you, and again, I know you have a little bit of a, a time push here, but uh, I really wanted to touch on. And again, if if we can do a third part, that'd be amazing. Um, the top outcome measures a for uh, when return to sport, if you will, of triple hop. Uh, you know, single hop, vertical hop, uh, crossover, all that fun stuff versus, or, or this part B of that, if, if I can throw it out now and, and I'll let you go wherever you take it, is um, how valuable is that to a prevention kind of screening to have those baseline data A is useful if an injury happens, but if we have an imbalance there for, for some of the programs, um, it, it, is there anything to the preventative side or me as somebody who had an ACL, you know, 15 years ago or whatever now, uh, is that something I should keep an eye on? Is it something I should be incorporating, not as necessarily an ACL prevention thing at that point, but as an athletic performance and possible other injuries? So anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a broad question. I'll let you do what you do with it. And again, I know um, you have a cutoff yeah. on time, so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's an excellent question, Bo. And again, you know, a few different sub questions there. Uh, again, if I forget any one of them, please uh, jump back on this, or we can leave it for part <laughs> three. Um, so, so yes, first question is in terms of screening. So, can we identify those athletes at higher risk uh, by uh, you know screening them? Uh, a highly controversial topic. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the best minds in the field they disagree on that. It really depends on how how you see. It. There are there is some research that shows that they, especially among female athletes, those who demonstrate greater dynamic valgus, uh, mm -hmm. it, it can predispose them mm -hmm. to ACL injury. Again, it is you know one of the studies that I'm really proud of, and we did this with Tim Hewitt and uh, the, the and Greg Meyer and Kevin Ford. Uh, looked at a very large sample of uh, high school athletes. And, and because, you know, it was one of the largest biomechanical studies in the field, we managed to identify subgroups. So a small subgroup, about 14% of these athletes, they demonstrate exceptionally high uh, dynamic valgos. Uh, mm -hmm. And then dynamic valgos is also a component. So 40%, 40, they land beautifully, you know, biomechanically mm -hmm. uh, aligned. And this may be the group that is uh, less prone to injury. Um, and then there is two groups that had a combination of uh, different deficits. Um, so yeah, a highly complex area. Uh, again, um, in terms of, of uh, hopefully, as we move forward with artificial intelligence and larger sample sizes and wearable sensors, which is another mm -hmm. area that hopefully we'll have the time to talk about more because we do a lot of research there especially now here with my colleagues at the Biomechanical Engineering School at the University of Wollongong, I will be able to delve more into uh, identifying those, those that are, that are at higher risk. Uh, but the tools that we have right now are, are not great in terms of mm. identification. Mm. Um, one thing that- You got, you know, you got these is, tools. You got these uh, tools, right? You got the that's eyes. That's right. You have the you eyes. Have but, the eyes yeah. of the clinician. Yeah. Hopefully, the eyes of the clinician, which can be deceiving, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, 
some of these deficits are actually uh, probably even visible to the naked eye. Um, now, the other question that you have was about return to sports. Um, again, uh, this may be worth its own podcast itself. Yeah. Um, Bef so, yeah, it's because yeah. it's so big, I wanted to maybe jump in. Mm -hmm. So, in, again, when I was uh, recovering and, and my first clinic, I don't know if you ever visited Star Physical Therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's since changed its name, but pretty, pretty popular clinic. Um, and we had the isokinetic biodex. So, again, back then, the return to sport protocol. And also, again, this is, I'm super curious because I use a handheld dynamometer to look at. And again, I know that we can work about, talk about uh, the best way to st standardize the assessment itself. Mm -hmm. How should we be measuring hip abduction? Um, and the, mm -hmm. the, the biodex it allows us to also measure through the full range of motion, force production, peak torques, all this fun stuff. So at the end of the day, when it punched out the data for return to sport, especially higher competitive sports, we were if you had more than a 10% difference, right. right, between limbs, that was like, we're not there yet, right? 10%, I don't know if that number is about where you would uh, go with in terms of, again, higher level sports versus a, a jogging or something like that, right. just, you know, so uh, yeah, so again, I know it's a, it's another uh, thing, but I definitely wanted to throw that at you. Which is a, an excellent question, and again, maybe we can close with this, uh, and then we, we, that, we don't have time to delve into the data, but hopefully the part five or six will be just <laughs> about that. Um, but uh, yeah, the 10% hasn't changed too much, so yes, strength is is one of the main variables that we're looking in terms of return to sport, and 10% and actually comes from like Typically, that's the natural variability between legs uh, mm -hmm. in healthy people. So if you are within 10%, then you, you assume that you have, uh, you're have you within normal limits. Uh, but there is some other variables. You mentioned some of the hop tests. Again, they have their own limitations. And then in some research, recent research that came out of Aspetar, which is a powerhouse of research in this area, showed some of the limitations of this test. Um, but, but I would draw the attention of the listeners to a couple of studies that were published a few, just a few years ago that looked at return to sports and, as a pre and some of these outcomes as a predictor of re-injury. Um, mm -hmm. One key thing here is time. So, mm -hmm. so based on this research, we should not, and that's a main message for our physical therapists out there who are listening, but also for the patients, who are keen to return to competitive sports after an ACL reconstruction, returning to sports earlier than nine months after reconstruction is a major risk factor for injury. So the vast majority of these injuries happen within two years after ACL reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So waiting out actually has a lot of benefits. While at the same time, you know, you, it's not like you're waiting out uh, watching TV, you are <laughs> rehabbing the knee. So mm -hmm. it does really take, you know, my, my friend Tim Hewitt published an editorial in sports medicine advocating for waiting, you know, uh, a long time uh, mm -hmm. after an ACL reconstruction to, to allow some homeostasis around the knee to return to. Yeah. Um, so there is an argument to be made about uh, waiting, while at the same time, symmetry. One thing that has not received a lot of attention is a biomechanical assessment. Mm. As physical mm -hmm. therapists, you know, we do all the measure all these metrics in terms of power, strength, range of motion, and so on and so forth. But going back to the beginning, that's a probably <laughs> a nice way to close the loop. Um, biomechanics can mm -hmm. be a predictor of injury. So if you don't address the problem and you let the athlete go back and, 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 and perform athletic maneuvers in a way that is uh, uh, risky, then this athlete is coming back uh, with an ACL injury at the other knee or even a, a torn graft a few months later. And I think that's where we have failed, uh, mm. you know, in combining what we know of in terms of the prevention uh, with the rehabilitation part. So, yeah, again, great topic for a PhD. So send me an email <laughs> if you want to do a PhD on this topic. <laughs> Uh, we already we already have two. She, my wife has a PhD. I don't. I don't. We have enough okay. PhD. Yeah. Oh, you enough, can never have enough. enough. <laughs> can never have enough PhDs. I'll let you. I know you have to run to another meeting. I really appreciate your time, good sir. Um, and how is the Vegemite? I've never tried it. Um, I, I was a bit traumatized. So uh, <laughs> when the first year that I was here in Australia, I did a silent retreat where you're not allowed to talk here in the Blue Mountains, mm. and they put a bowl of Vegemite, which I thought it was 
um, uh, chocolate. <laughs> and I put a big slab of it and it's, you know, salty. So I took a bite and obviously it didn't taste good because I did it the wrong way. And I haven't tried it since. My son loves it and he's wow. three and a half. <laughs> but, but, Bo, I want to say, um, yeah, going back to quick, could make things work with the injury. So Trisha agrees with that. So yeah, absolutely. There is good research to show that. Um, uh, but, but Bo, I just want to thank you. You know, it has been uh, lovely that uh, probably as a result of uh, the pandemic, uh, we uh, get to reconnect and see each other quite regularly. Um, and we haven't really talked uh, since uh, probably you graduated, you know, like a, a <laughs> couple of years after, after you graduated. So it's good to reconnect and uh, also um, listen to anybody who's interested in these uh, topics. So I'm looking forward to, to the next part. We, we have a lot of topics to cover. Let me know when you're scheduled on my side, and uh, we'll let you go today. Thank you again, good sir. And uh, I, the Vegemite thing, I don't know. I've, I've never tried it, so when, anyway. When you come and visit, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk, try it together. Absolutely. <laughs> that's that's All a right. deal. All right. Take care. We'll talk Take soon. Care. All right. Bye-bye.